Welcome to Corwin's Teacher to Teacher podcast with host Carol Pelletier Radford. Carol is an experienced classroom teacher, university educator, founder of mentoringinaction.com, and author of four best selling professional books for teachers. She believes the best form of professional learning happens when teachers engage in authentic conversations and share their wisdom. In every episode, Carol and her guests share stories about pivotal moments in their careers, successful classroom strategies, and personal actions they take to minimize stress and stay healthy. The Teacher to Teacher podcast is a place to engage in authentic conversation and reflection with experienced educators. We hope these conversations will energize you, keep you inspired, and remind you why you chose to become a teacher. Hi, welcome to the Teacher to Teacher podcast, sharing our wisdom with our host, Carol Radford. I am Tori Bachman, a Corwin editor and co-organizer of this podcast, which we've created for teachers at all levels who are searching for practical wisdom that they can use in their classrooms. We believe we're all constantly learning and learning together. To share their wisdom today, we have two teacher guests, Jim Burke and Jennifer Barrientos. I'd like to introduce them to you now. Jim Burke taught high school English for 35 years to students at all grade levels. He is the author of over 30 books, including The English Teacher's Companion, The Common Core Companion, and Academic Moves. His most recent Corwin title, Teaching Better Day by Day, published in April 2023. Jim is currently working as an advisor to an ed tech company that's committed to student success. Hey, Jim, it's good to see you today. Very nice to be here, Tori. And joining us today is Jennifer Barrientos, a teacher who's featured in Carol's recent book titled, When I Started Teaching, I Wish I Had Known, Weekly Wisdom for Beginning Teachers. Jennifer is a 10th year educator who has served as a special education teacher, school case manager, district specialist, and district administrator. She currently teaches special education for grades three through eight in the Beverly City School District. In her free time, Jennifer likes to read, watch movies, and explore new places with her husband. Hey, Jennifer, thanks for being here today. Hi, everyone. Happy to be uh, here. Hi, hi, Jen. Nice to see you and Jim. Welcome to this uh, very new and exciting podcast adventure, Teacher to Teacher. So we intentionally wanted to have two teachers having a conversation. And before we get started, and I tap into some of your inner wisdom, Jim from his many years and Jen from your experience in 10 years in, in teaching, I'd like to just give our audience, our listeners, a snapshot of why you chose to become teachers and maybe a two or three highlights along that journey that are meaningful for our listeners. Jennifer, wh why do you become a teacher and how did you end up where you are in Beverly? Is that in New Jersey? Yeah, that's in New Jersey. Um, we're not too far from Philadelphia. We can see Philadelphia across the river, so we're pretty close. Um, I actually didn't start out um, you know, going to school for teaching. I fell into teaching one of my professors um, was retiring as a special education teacher at a juvenile detention center um, in Indianapolis. And um, I was not on that track. And when I met him, he said, no, 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 you're a teacher. And he said, I'm retiring, go apply for an emergency license and go apply for this job. And I really respected Mr. House, who is the gentleman who, um, who, uh, you know, kind of got me into this. And um, so I did, and I got the job and, and the, the story kind of <laughs> just evolves from there. Um, I, I moved around a lot in Indianapolis and Illinois, my husband's in the military. Um, and so I had a lot of different experiences from being a classroom teacher, a special education classroom teacher, um, to a district specialist for students with emotional behavioral disorders. Um, and then, um, it kind of evolved, um, when I met Dr. Radford, when I was in North Chicago, um, and I was the, let me, let me slow down with this one, right. teacher. <laughs> teacher yeah. residency and induction program supervisor. Um, and essentially what I did was I supported um, brand new staff to the district and their mentors through the whole first through fourth year of their teaching experience. Um, and so we used Dr. Radford's books to, to build that curriculum out. It was wonderful. Um, and so here I am, came back to New Jersey. Um, I'm in a wonderful school district. I have only wonderful things to say um, about my current school district. And, and that's it. 
And you're teaching second grade or something, right? What are you well, teaching? Yeah. So, well, right now I'm teaching third through third? eight. I oh, three through eight. eight. This summer, I'm going to be doing a little different kindergarten to second grade. Oh, that's what I saw. Oh, my yeah. goodness. Well, that's exciting. And did you say at the beginning that you were teaching in a juvenile detention center? I was an Indianapolis juvenile detention center. Um, and I co-taught algebra. So yeah. that was your launch into teaching. And then how did you get your credential? Like, did you just went back to college after that? Or I did um, I had a bachelor's degree from Rutgers. And um, so I took that in my military experience. And we um, I, I enrolled in Taylor University and got my teaching um, licensing for early, early elementary and elementary teaching, and then eventually into special ed and then my principal license. Um, but it was all really like a little bit at a time. Right. Following the breadcrumbs, I call it. You're following. And you were in the military as well. I was. I was in the Army for 10 years. Well, thank you for your service. All right, Jim, what's your story? The master um, English teacher. Well, it's, I, I think it's, it's fascinating to hear Jennifer talk about her path. I think one of the things, you know, with, with anybody becoming a teacher, very few people seem to have a nice, straight, linear path. Uh, that you know that that uh, they they lead. It's not like a for most people. It's not like a family business that you jump into and uh, and kind of follow along. Uh, so I you know I come from a family of wonderful supportive parents, uh, but you know my dad dropped out of high school in, in the ninth grade or thereabouts, and uh, and so I come from a very working class background and graduated. Uh, from high school in the bottom 10% of my class. So I really was not, I think if you'd come to me, you know, uh, at the end of high school and said, so I know, I know, I know, you're, you're like really, really way down there at the bottom, but just flash forward, just, just so you know, you're gonna actually become a teacher. Uh, and then, uh, you know, fun fact for your current teachers, you're gonna grow up and write books telling people how to be a teacher. <laughs> I love I that. I, I think my high school <laughs> oh my teachers God. would just be terrified. Um, <laughs> And uh, the you know my my adolescence was was completely consumed by tennis, which ended up in the long run having an impact on me as a teacher. But I used to play the national hardcourt championships at the club that is in the parking lot where I would, where I ended up spending twenty eight years teaching. So I just think life is very strange, right? Like if you'd walked up to me at fourteen and said, "Before you go play your match, just so you know." You're going to actually come back here as an adult and be an English teacher in that in that school that your mom's parking in front of for most of your life. I would have just it would have just been the most absurd thing. So I, I think in a, in a very strange way, all these things end up, you know, part, you know, contributing to my, you know, formation as, as a as a person who became a teacher. You know, I wasn't doing school well at all, uh, but, uh, you know, I was learning and being taught you know, at a very high level for tennis. And I learned what it takes to be able to learn how to do something well. And I think later on that that really played an important part. Um, and then when I when I did get out of high school, I realized like, okay, uh, so everybody went, to, went away to college except me. Uh, and so I was, uh, so after my first year in college where I was studying business, because isn't that what men do? You get a degree in business so you can make money, I guess. Uh, I mean, if you come from a family where nobody's ever gone to college, nobody, Nobody has any idea what it, you know, how it works. I think we're a little better these days at kind of guiding kids, especially through certain certain programs. Um, so after that first year in community college, where I began to wake up and learn, you know, basically what we would call now the academic literacies. So I think that even that experience is a formative experience in, into the teacher that I became because I really had to learn how to be a student. I had to learn you know, develop an identity of myself as somebody who, you know, does, you know, the work of a student. And uh, I wish I'd kept some of them, but I had, like, for my first semester in college, I had textbooks where, like, the whole chapter was highlighted. I love that. College. Remember the yellow highlighters, Yeah, right? mine was blue, because I was a boy, <laughs> and I, 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 I kind of, you know, and I felt I like that. I was being serious, like yes. I am I am doing college level reading. Yes. And then, of course, when the test would come along, I would think like, well, how does this help? I mean, every, I just have 30 pages of blue. Um, and after that first year, I, I, I had a chance to go up one summer to, to pull out trees in 110 degree weather up in Northern California. Or I saw a job on a board to go be a camp counselor. And there was 
you know, I'd never worked with kids before, uh, but something about that just like, you know, kind of was yanking at me. And so I took that job uh, after my freshman year in college and just had a, a really transformative experience of just working with kids and like realizing that kids were, you know, were kind of something that, that I wanted to get to know more about. And then when I went down to college in the fall in Santa Barbara, I, I visited the family of uh, the, the Brady's uh, and uh, down in LA and I visited the family where two of these kids that I'd really had a great connection with were and it's a strange thing, but I like I wasn't a big coffee drinker yet at the time, and I sat there surrounded by the family and the, and and the two Brady boys, and I drank coffee and talked all night long, and and I went up to the guest room, and I was so wired, I I had no chance of going to sleep that night, and and this conversation erupted in my head about like, look, this is so clearly what you're interested in doing is working with kids, um. And at about four o'clock that morning, I just had this epiphany of like, well, then obviously you should just be a teacher, right? And uh, and figure out. Uh, so there really was this kind of this definitive moment. And then from that point on, I came back to Santa Barbara and changed my major to cognitive psychology. And I learned all about learning. And um, the funny, the, the one other funny thing about some of this stuff is that I, you know, so I ended up making a career as an English teacher and writing a lot of books about teaching English. Um, I never actually got a degree in English, I, and I think one of the things that uh, has really shaped me as a teacher in ways that are hard to plan for is I, I just end up feeling like I came in through the back door on a lot of things, you know, so I have a degree in, in cognition and learning, which very few teachers actually study. Uh, it seems a little bit relevant to being a teacher. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, when I got that degree in English, uh, I ended up working at a variety of experiences, but I started as a special ed teacher. Uh, and I think that, you know, Jennifer can talk about what it's like to be a special ed teacher these days. It's changed a lot, but, you know, I, I think all these experiences really contributed. So I, my first efforts as a teacher were with kids that you could never assume that they knew how to do anything, right? And I think it just really had an impact on, you know, the kind of teacher that I ended up becoming. Thank you, Jim. So you both have very different pathways, and yet you're, bo you're both teaching in some ways special ed. You, you've, I think our listeners can benefit and, and tie your stories to their stories, because what we're learning is the intuitive voice, Jim's intuitive voice told him to become a teacher. Jen had someone from the outside say, you're a teacher. <laughs> you need to do this. So we all have these various uh, paths that come to us. This podcast is about wisdom that happens along that pathway and that inner wisdom that guides us or that we reflect upon. So I, I invited each of you to share a story from an insight that may have happened during your time in teaching where there was some significant growth where you had that epiphany like Jim had when he went, I'm going to be a teacher. I actually like work. What, something that happened to you that you can share with our audience that may resonate with them or maybe get them to think about and reflect on their own career. Jen, what, what shows up for you as something significant that shaped you as the teacher you are today? Um, for me, I, so when I was in Indianapolis, before we moved to Illinois, um, I had a mentor who was essentially like angel on earth for me. Her name is Lisa Roselle. Um, she's still in Indianapolis. She's a district administrator and she had me, um, I, I worked for her essentially. I was the emotional disability specialist. So I work with students who had really high needs and were in self-contained classrooms. Um, and, and, you know, believe it or not, we had a lot of teacher turnover, right? Um, and so one of our classrooms, we just could not get a teacher in there that, that would stay. Um, and so me being the specialist, that was essentially what happened is I got put in that classroom as the teacher for, um, I think it was maybe two months. Um, and I, I had a lot of challenges because, um, you know, I hadn't been in that type of classroom for a long time. The behaviors were really, really big. Um, and it was uh, grades two to four. Um, and so I, you know, I leaned on my paraprofessional so much, um, but I definitely leaned on uh, one of our specialists there who helped with behavior. 
Um, and we really, it became like a marriage. Um, he understood what I needed and I understood what he needed because we communicated so much. Um, and and the, the kids in the classroom knew you could not you could not ask one for something and the other would be on a different page. We were so connected. Um, and I think that that communication really changed me. Um, um, but one thing when I uh, was going through this time and trying to really help these little people um, be successful and just find that they could trust me in our classroom um, was I, I would talk to my mentor about all the issues we were having. And she said, you have to make yourself part of the problem or you can't make yourself part of the solution. And that's something that I've kept with me since then. And this was what, 26, 17. And I've kept that with me the whole time. And every time I have something I can't get over and my, you know, a, a problem with another staff member or somebody who um, I'm working with, I always remind myself, okay, if you're not part of that problem, you can't fix it. You can't be part of the solution. Um, you, and, and, and that's kind of, I think what it was is, is just communicating with my, my team and making myself um, part of that problem, right? So you were identifying the problem. You were, you, is that what your mentor meant? Like to identify what the problem is here that the kids are doing the go to this person to get that or that. And yeah, that's how you um, mean be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, 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 you know, when I, when I talk about like accepting feedback, it's very hard when you're doing everything okay. you can, accepting feedback is really hard. Um, and so I started to put myself out there and ask for feedback. Um, and I would ask her for feedback. I would ask my partner in the classroom for feedback. And we would really just try to be part of the solution in that way of what's the actual problem going on? How can we communicate better? Um, how can we make sure that if I'm out of the room, he's saying the same thing I am. And if he's out of the room, I'm saying the same thing he is. Um, and I, we really did see a lot of growth out of those little people in our classroom. Um, and I do think that they felt safe um, after we had been with them for a long time. So I think that answered your question. Yes, thank you. And yeah. Jim, so Jim, what what story do you have to share that's some significant moment in time that you remember from the classroom that's a real experience? Because wisdom, I think, comes from that real experience, like Jen was saying. I'm gonna I'm gonna answer your question, but I'm gonna bounce bounce a question back at you as a transition, Carol, because I, okay. I I love I love the title of your new book uh, and that idea of weekly wisdom for beginning teachers. You know, the, the poet Rilke has this line, you know, that a lot of people like to quote, which is that, you know, basically every time I sit down to write a poem, it's a poem that's never been written. And I'm and I'm a, a first time writer all over again. Right. And I'm always a beginner. Mm -hmm. And when I when I think about when I listen to Jennifer talk about the different contexts in which she's moved into and, you know, it seems like she moves up and down to kind of grades and context in, in different ways than, than I have. Uh, do you, I guess I'm asking this of you, Carol, like do you find that a lot of the people that you talk to, even if they were experienced teachers, kind of maintain a sense of that being a beginning teacher, kind of, you know, to kind of be open to it, but also kind of come to the challenges kind of with an excitement of new problems to solve? I, I think, I mean, that's a great question as we are all reflecting on and look using reflection and inquiry um, to look back on what we've done. But and that's what that book was when I started teaching. I wish I had known caused very experienced teachers to look back right. like Jennifer just had to do. And she wrote that story for the book. She had to stop and think, well, what? where did I learn something <laughs> like what well, instead of where a lot of times we're always looking ahead to what do I do next like you said with the poem a, a new poem and mentors I work mostly with mentor teachers and the research even does show that mentor teachers say they learn just as much as the beginning teachers by going through those steps of guiding someone. So Jen's, Jennifer, your experience of two people being on the same page, the common language, the kind of reading each other's minds, but it was intentionally to solve a problem of very bad misbehavior in the classroom that was caused by splitting, like the kids figured out how to split the team. So back to Jim's question, that I believe that insight as I talk to people comes from our own taking our own time to reflect and look back at those 
nuggets, if you will, that guide us to be a t a more intentional teachers. And I'm calling it wisdom. I, I think it's teacher wisdom. That's why this podcast is really so special and why I agreed to host is because I believe our voices, Jim, your voice, you've been writing and doing all this and being honest about like, you're not the perfect candidate. You, you just, you defined that you weren't the perfect candidate to be a teacher because you were the lowest. Like you just broke that stigma for people who might be listening or have kids that are like, oh, wow, you could still be a teacher. If you're if you're not successful in high school, yeah, look at Jim. He wrote 30 books. So this, um, yeah, this question back at me is, I do believe that our personal reflection has to be intentional to find that wisdom through story. I like it through stories because I think it's more interesting than just saying, do this, do that. So well, yes. I, I definitely I think that that framing of story is, is a great idea, because I think once, you know, especially when you enter into a, you know, a, a career that, that one could describe as having more of a sense of vocation, there is kind of a narrative structure that you're entering into, right? I mean, like, yes. you all had, we all had teachers and we see, yes. you know, the best teachers and kind of the lives that they had. And we think like, that's the story that I want my life to tell. Yes, right? but everybody uh, doesn't know the pathway that you two just shared. And, and what we're hearing on this podcast is, as the listeners are listening in, when you hear all these episodes, you're going to hear everybody's pathway is so different. And yet students might think it was this linear path. You just right. say you want to be a teacher and then you become a teacher. Well, that isn't the case. So this is a great um, podcast for potential aspiring teachers as well. To, well, to I want to pick hear. up on that because yes. I think one, of the, one of the interesting connections. So I do want to answer your question more directly about kind of a pivotal moment. But one of the things that, you know, that Jennifer and I share in our own way is, you know, she she had her time in the military. And all of Angela Duckworth's studies, or at least her initial studies about grit were anchored in the military, right? Like what allowed people who got through basic training and who got through, you know, the, the army ranger training or whatever. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I see a lot, you know, and I, and I, it, it concerns me is amongst younger teachers, especially like new teachers, is kind of this feeling of like thumbs up or thumbs down, right? Like, oh, my lesson plan was like an exploding cigar in my face today. And if I was really meant to be a teacher, that wouldn't happen. So I'm out, you know, and uh, and I've and I've seen versions of that, uh, you know, in a, in a number of situations with, you know, my own experience with with having student teachers uh, and that that experience that, you know, when you so when you talk about wisdom, I think, you know, I was told uh, by actually the head of my, my my special ed program when I was when I was going into the Peace Corps overseas, he said it's going to be harder than anything you've ever done, and you need to do whatever you can to 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 move through that because everybody knows that if you can survive that kind of experience, you're the kind of person that can, that can handle anything, and I think that experience of you going through the military and we didn't compare you know. Uh, Yes, the military guys used to make fun of me like, oh, the Peace Corps is here uh, and we're all safe now. And um, but that experience, you know, for, for both of us, on, you know, has to have that that shared element of going through some very, very difficult challenges. And I do think that when, you know, I was telling you guys before we started filming, my teaching assignment in the Peace Corps was to teach woodshop all day to 12 special ed students without any wood. Uh, so, you know, making right. teachers if you could do part that. of lesson plan every yes. day. And wonder, that, that wisdom of being able to get through those challenging experiences right. was essential. Right. I want to get back to a couple things that you said that I think are important here. And then I do want to hear your pivotal moment. Sure. But um, all of these are pivotal. Uh, this, uh, this desire for the beginning teachers to be perfect or to do everything well, I am seeing that as well. And that's why part of the conversation and the wisdom that we need to share is this, is you're going to have a bad day. You're not going to have a perfect left lesson plan. And the teacher's role isn't just stand and deliver content in a perfect way. It's, a, it's that human quality behind the stand and deliver content, the way our schools are structured. So 
what's happening is we do have a lot of career changers. And in some ways, the Peace Corps and the military, that's a career changer. It wasn't I decided to become a teacher. I went to college. I did the pedagogy. I, that's what I call a traditional path. Right. And we do not have as many traditional pathway teachers. So the listeners who are listening probably say, yeah, you're right. I am. And, and some called it alternative route. I, I spent years helping math and science and military people become teachers and teaching the hardest, hard to staff school in the country. So these career changers also have to understand that they bring wisdom from their other career. And that's what I'm hearing you say. And that we are not doing a good enough job with pulling in those other other uh, aspects of the previous career to the quote, stand and deliver this math content, this English content, whatever, because that's a lot of wisdom that we need to harvest. So thank I you for bringing that up. I, and I don't you think that, that a lot of those teachers, Carol, like to the, those later career teachers, they also bring that wisdom in from basically what we call the real world, right? So yes, they, you get yes. like a 40 year old who yes. was in the tech industry and sees a 16 year old doing something and then they're in a position to say like hey look buddy that is not gonna fly right. in the real world right you've got to push through what's difficult for you and learn how to solve yes. those problems and right? we've seen the stories of brilliant people from harvard who have their content mit everywhere and you but you have to learn how to have a relationship with the kids as well so right. there there's you we need both but but i like to frame it as wisdom or and and also well-being which we're going to get into but i want to hear your pivotal moment like in two two minutes what, sure. what's your pivotal because i think it's important you have a lot of wisdom so i think the the nothing made a bigger difference in i think in ways both personally and professionally than uh you know i started writing about about my teaching even as a student teacher i got my first piece published uh, about a day in the life of the student teacher and um and then in about my second or third year teaching i you know i was writing some things for teacher magazine and whatnot and i got a, a, a it was either a letter it might have been an email but this might even be before email from carol jago who a lot of people know from her work as, as a teacher and, edu and an author and and so she sent me this email she said oh i'm seeing all the stuff you're writing what are you reading and i wrote back and i said uh you know because you can't talk to carol jago without talking about reading and she and I said, oh, you know, I, I don't have any time because I'm, I'm learning how to teach all these books. And she wrote back and she said, that's ridiculous. Like people make people make time for the things that I think are important. You know, get a New Yorker subscription. Even if you just look at the cartoons every week, your, your life will be enriched. Uh, and I did. I, I just, you know, uh, and, you know, the, a woman I used to work with used to say we all need somebody that we can't stand the idea of disappointing. And you know, Carol Jago, you know, as well as Diane McClain, the woman that, that said that uh, became those people like I, you know, when they said, like, what are you reading? I it became really important to me to not say like, oh, nothing. I'm just reading Lord of the Flies because I'm teaching it. And and that it just it, I never kind of got off that that escalator or whatever you want to call it uh, and nothing, you know, and then it, it kind of grew into professional reading and it just became such a, you know, such a presence in my life. And, uh, you know, then as time's gone on, you discover audiobooks. So if you're commuting to work, you can read more. But that, you know, and so, you know, probably one of my favorite comments that a student ever made about me as a teacher, you know, because I'm constantly referring to books and stuff like that. This this guy from Stanford studied my class for a year and he's interviewing the student and the student says, it's so weird. Mr. Burke talks about this stuff like it really matters. <laughs> I love that. You know, which I, I, you know, I love it. Like, you know, like so the, this I, is going to be meaningful to me. <laughs> yeah, because it, you know, uh, like what a weird idea that you know the, the, the uh, talking about books really matters. I so know. that so that moment with Carol, uh, you know, and that's still a part of our relationship. I mean, if we trade emails today, it's what are you reading or what are you oh, reading? God, I, read this yeah. I love that. The other piece of what you said that I think is important is when. We talk to teachers at, at the beginning, mentor, it doesn't matter. It is, I don't have time. So when I would be working with mentoring conversations or I worked with Jennifer in her district about uh, making time for, well, we don't have time to talk. We don't have time. So 
you it's a bigger message than just reading it's the how do we respond when someone asks us what we're doing and I, i'm not saying that i would have said i should read more but it might be something else i should walk more right. i should right. so we have to be attentive to what people are saying around us because everybody is a mentor for us and that's how you made that decision to become a teacher you say it was the coffee it was your intuitive voice knocking on you your door and and jennifer saying yes when somebody said you're a teacher she could have walked away and said no i'm not or i don't have time so these are this is the hidden wisdom nuggets that that contribute to our behavior and our choices our choices come if we don't miss them, if we don't stay on this path and we block everything out. So thank you for sharing that. Now for the podcast listeners, we do want to give practical tips because everybody's like, I want some takeaways. What can I actually do? You guys have been teaching and I'm a beginner. So I asked you to prepare something that I mean, the teachers could do any time, but around creating community in the classroom, because that's always important at the beginning of the school year and uh, and all year long and all year long. So something practical that our listeners could actually do. Jen Jennifer, what do you have for us? Yeah, I have um, a few things. I think um, the first thing, obviously, is relationships first. Um, you know, you keep kids do not learn from teachers they don't like. I've heard that a million times and they know when you don't like them. So I think that building a, a genuine relationship with your students is number one. You cannot teach them how to write a perfect sentence if they don't really like you or they think you don't like them. Um, another thing is that to stay, not stay, but become the calmest person in the room. They need to trust you and they need to trust you in the same way they trust a parent because you're with them more than their parents are, right? So you're in the classroom with them for how many hours a day? They need to trust that you have their best interests in mind, that you wanna see them succeed, that you love them, that you know you wanna see them grow up to be these wonderful humans. Um, and I think I think that the, next, the last thing I wanna share is to have a fresh start every day. Um, I learned this with uh, having a self-contained classroom and kids who have these big, big behaviors they cannot control. Next day, they'll walk into the classroom and they think that you're going to have a grudge against them and they're going to, you're going to treat them badly. But when they see that you're like excited to see them and, uh, you know, you're not holding anything against them, they're like relieved. And, and then, and that builds trust too. But then also like that helps you to be able to teach them. You're more likely to get through to a, a little person who is like relieved that you're not mad at them anymore. Right. Um, and I, and I use that today, you know, even with kids who don't have bad behaviors in the classroom, um, sometimes they don't perform the way that they, you know, they can to their full potential. And they know, they know you're a little disappointed that they didn't do what they were supposed to do or do what you expected them to do. But the next day is brand new and fresh. So do you actually articulate that and say it to them like, okay, Joey, fresh start today and smile. And so there's a physical behavior that they can see. Is there a cue that you practice use that teachers could actually copy what you're saying? Yeah, I, I don't rem I don't remind them when they did something wrong the day. Before. Okay. Okay. So we'll have like pet names for all of my students. I call them nuggets. Um, okay. I call them little, <laughs> little sweet things I call my own kids. And then they realize, oh, she's actually not mad at me you know, and right. when they come in the room and they see me treat the kid who always does the right thing the same way I'm treating them. Ah, no okay. Different. Okay. Yeah. I love that. Is there one thing that comes to mind that's uh, specific about building the relationship at the, at the beginnings? Like a beginner might say, yeah, but how do you build a relationship? It's the beginning of school. Like, did you do something specific that helped to build that relationship? Yeah, I try to get to know each kid, their families, the things they like. Um, okay. I have students right now, uh, uh, soccer is super big in New Jersey. Soccer is everything. Um, and so my my little guys have been obsessed with the World Cup this year, and they all have their favorite players. Um, and so, like, when they come into the classroom, I might call them by their favorite player. You know, like, oh, cool. I love that. Um, and then they know I'm listening, 
but then it brightens their spirit a little bit. Right. Um, and then like some have little siblings and I'll ask them how their baby siblings are or okay. them sports or anything like that, but getting to know them. And I don't put a lot of pressure on myself to have like the perfect classroom. I am not a TikTok teacher. I am not an Instagram teacher. You can't walk into my classroom and like everything's color coded. Like that's so much pressure. Um, right. It doesn't help. You know, it doesn't help. So what do you think about Messi going to Miami? He's coming over. Have <laughs> well, you been following the world soccer? I mean, my, my, my son is big into soccer. So I'm learning Premier. I had to watch Ted Lasso. I have to get all the soccer lingo so I can talk to my own adult sons who, yeah. who like no, soccer. I, I, I saw that in the news and I have to get my update because I've been out of You better get your update. You better get, my you update. Better get your soccer because they'll be looking for two days of you yeah. to come in and talk soccer. So thank you for that. Yeah. What about you, Jim? Years of, what are your biggest successful community building beginning of the year, what should people be doing? Well, I, in, in so many ways, I just echo everything that, that Jennifer just said. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I didn't know that uh, being a TikTok or Instagram teacher meant having a color coordinated room. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I will say, though, that I think uh, that I don't know what what your experience was the last couple of years, Jen. So I, I retired in June of 22. So so I taught all all throughout the you know the the pandemic, uh, and the twenty one twenty two clear was a hundred percent online for us uh, because we lost access to our actual school space in our in our program, uh, and it and it really made me think about the importance of relationships at a whole different level uh, than I had ever thought about it before. Um, so so in, in a lot of ways, I would I would just say. Uh, you know, 100% agreement with the idea of making connections. But what are some of the things that that I do I, that I think make a big difference? Uh, and I and I think these are you can't overemphasize this. I, I read somewhere recently that there was some some research done uh, in the last year, I believe, and maybe this is you know colored by the by the COVID experience. But there was some research done that found that I think it was only 20 25% of students felt like their students their their teachers actually uh had a connection to them and i think you know i understand that more in the you know because of all the different obstacles during covid but i i draw a lot of energy from from my students and i think going back to you know what i was saying earlier about my own experience i think what i what i understand you know intuitively maybe originally but but much more intentionally over time uh is if you're a kid like i was you know where you're you know your family you know nobody went to college uh, and you know, like, I don't, I think if I just said I wasn't going to go to college, my, my parents would have said, okay, well get a job. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I think the importance of those connections were, were just essential to me. Um, so one of the things that I do, so I, I've, I've taught, you know, high school, you know, all these years and mostly juniors and seniors in the last 10, 10, 15 years. Um, and I want them to leave, like one of the questions that I ask myself when I'm designing that first day at school uh, is what do I want the kids to leave my very, very first class thinking and feeling about my class and about me. Uh, and so I want them, be, you know, because they're, they're juniors or seniors, I want them leaving feeling like, okay, that was, that was a little different. Uh, I'll give them, I'll come back, I'll give them one more day. Uh, before I write it off as like just another English class. So on the first day for years, I've put up as they walk into class, I put up uh, a, a famous painting called Wander Above a Sea of Mist. I don't tell them what the title is. And I just use it to have them start generating questions. Uh, they have to, you know, what do they think it's titled? And why do they think that that title? And then they have to talk with each other. So I'm kind of, you know, there's there, there are no wrong questions, there are no wrong responses. So I want them to immediately feel like, okay, so I, you know, I'm welcomed into the conversation. What what I there's room for what I think, uh, you know, out of the gate. Um, you know, he's not telling me things; he's asking me things, and then having them turn towards each other to use those questions as a base for discussion, so that they leave the first day feeling like. Okay, so you know, active, interactive, 
uh, engaging, room for, for my questions, you know, not just kind of one directional. Um, and uh, and then within that, and then we'll, you know, we'll talk about it as a whole class. Uh, before they would have ever shown up to my class that first day, uh, and this has kind of become easier because of, you know, the school learning management systems like Canvas, uh, I will, uh, as, as soon as all the kids' names and stuff become available online, uh, for, for years, I've sent an email out to my classes, uh, you know, with, you know, just stuff that's all about, it's not like, be sure to bring a binder, you know, it's very much about, you know, connection, maybe, maybe sharing a couple things that I did, you know, over the summer, so they get a, a little bit of a sense of who this person is, maybe a little bit about, you know, just how much I love teaching English, like I want them knowing that they're coming in, you know, to the class of a guy who, uh, you know, actually thinks this stuff matters. Uh, and, um, you know, maybe some little little hint about where we're going to go. Uh, and I just, you know, I, I think th that those efforts to build relationships, you know, a lot of them circle back around to what Jennifer was saying, you know, kids, the, the number of times, especially in the last couple of years that kids have said that it made such a difference that I recognize their birthday. Uh, it's the smallest thing, but the difference that it makes, because, you know, especially in the last couple of years where kids just felt so isolated, uh, you, you just can't uh, exaggerate the, 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 you know, the, how much that means to kids. Uh, and then the one other thing that I would say is I, on that first day, you know, I've, I've got, uh, well, the last couple of years I've done it as a Google form, but uh, a student interest survey. So it's just a sense to, you know, it might, it might be like, you know, finish this sentence, like when I think of English in you know, my past experiences, the word that comes to mind is, uh, so that's kind of, that can be dangerous. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, <laughs> I bet and, you have gotten uh, a lot of But then I'm talking about my responses. class, so, so you know, if I wanna, <laughs> like I wanna hear what they're saying and you know, like what's your, you know, favorite book on a scale of one to 10, like like how, how much do you enjoy reading? Like it's not hardcore, uh, you know, analysis, but it's, you know, an, from their own perspective, instead of just looking at their grades, uh, getting a sense of, you know, kind of what, what they value, you know, are they, are they on sports teams, you know, that kind of stuff. Cause you know, if they are on the soccer team or whatever, it just matters a huge amount to them to say like, Hey, how'd that game go yesterday? I think clearly you're both, you're clear. You're both sharing about relationships and getting to know the kids. I especially like the birthday because I like to celebrate my birthday week. Like it's not even a day anymore. It's like I want a lot of fun things. So when students see them on the wall or when you say happy birthday, I haven't heard that one before. And I really want to underscore that special um, activity that we can do as teachers. So Carol, can I, can I add one yes. piece about the birthday? Yes. It, it it never would have occurred to me until about two years ago when a student um, was really was really distressed, and I said, "What's you know, what's going on?" Everybody in your whole social media sphere knows that your birthday now, and so to not get recognized on your birthday, uh, or to just have like you know your your uncle Bob and grandma. You know, ah, and send you a thing over, you know, your social media feed uh, is it's so magnified now, you know, if kids don't get, I mean, even adults, if they if they like nobody, everybody knew because nobody it was remembered, online, you know, the, right, the message went out and right, nobody right. even like gave me a like acknowledged it, acknowledge it. Yeah, that's a, well, that's a whole other conversation that we clearly could could have in another time about the influence of the social media on this connections. So we're winding down. I have a couple more questions. <clears throat> I just want to know in a sentence or two, Jennifer, how do you stay balanced? What do you do outside of school to maintain your sanity so you can come back in fresh? Do you have any special magic magic bullet ideas that we can take away from you? <laughs> what? What do you have? Um, one, I've shared this with uh, first year teachers when I was in North Chicago, because this is something that's worked for me is I, I like to kind of get dressed up for work a little bit. So I'll wear slacks and a nicer shirt. 
Um, but those are work clothes, right? And they don't feel very good <laughs> for the most part. They're a little <laughs> they work. <laughs> um, so when I get home from work, I change right away. Um, I'll change into my home clothes, my play clothes, essentially, right? And I think that that's a really good transition, like cognitively for me to go from work to not work, whether it's I'm working out, I'm putting workout clothes on or whatever it might be, but that's, you know, that just that transition and it helps me remember, okay, so I'm no longer on work mode, I'm on home mode. So focus in on like connecting with my son, connecting with my parents, connecting with my husband, my dog. So I think that's one of the things I, I, I stay true to for myself is if I'm in work clothes, I'm in work mode. So get out of that. <laughs> right. All right. I love the, thank you. That's, and it's clear and it's something that we can do. All right. Uh, Jim, what's your uh, way of decompressing, filling yourself with joy in a different sure. way? Something is, you know, the emotions of learning, you know, how hard it is. You'd think it would be easy to throw this little tiny fly on a little line. It's much harder than I, than I ever realized. And, and it constantly reminds me that the things that we ask our students to do that we've spent years and years and years learning how to do them are not often intuitive or not often easy so fly fishing is one um, my wife uh, my wife and i had three kids they're all uh, up into their 20s and 30s now but those years you know i made a real point of going you know going to the games and even if that meant sitting with bleachers grading papers or whatever it was but you know being present uh, and my wife, um, my, my wife's mother, who is going to be 97 next month, uh, lives with us. And so, you know, the the focus on our on our family has just been a very grounding, uh, supportive uh, part of my life. Uh, that's kind of taught me that it, it's important to keep keep your values clear, you know, and Thank not you. Kind of let the justification of like, I've got papers. I'm sorry. Yes. I can't. Yes. I don't have time for that. So I. I I like the the way you shared about the fly fishing and made the connection to our students that are learning things that we can be impatient about that they don't pick up as quickly because we've done them multiple times over years. And uh, I had that same experience when I learned how to play golf. And I was just like, yeah. why can't I just hit this little ball? Like my arm, my shoulder, keep your head down. I think my head is down, it's, isn't it down? And to relate it back to our students and our teaching, I think is a humbling way for us as teachers, especially those of us who are very experienced teachers for decades to, to understand. The other piece that I'm getting from both of you as well is, is the, that we're the whole, that there's a whole teacher. It's not just the stand and deliver this special needs curriculum or English. It's we, we are that whole person. We want to talk about fly fishing or golf too, as much as we're intentionally trying to get to know our kids. I think it's great for them to get to know us. And that's that whole circle of wisdom that we're talking about today in this podcast. So as we close out, I just want to ask each of you, Jennifer, what did it feel like to be published in this book? complete honor because I got to work with you for so long uh, implementing the curriculum and working with the mentors and I hated leaving my job in North Chicago I loved I loved working with the staff so it was just such an honor to be um, highlighted in the book um, and because I do have a passion for supporting new teachers um, and helping them kind of just like stay afloat you know so I'm glad this was your first and then your doctorate will be next yay yeah and um Jim, you have multiple books, but can you just give a shout out to this new one that has just come out, the title, why should people be reading this book? It's really important. Give us a little uh, uh, information. The book that, you know, that I've come out with now, Teaching Better Day by Day is, you know, it's a, it's a book, but really it's a planner. Um, it's a planner with, with kind of a book within it. Uh, and um, and so I've been, you know, we've talked a lot about time in here. Time is something that has always, uh, I think it obsesses all teachers. Uh, and, um, you know, one, one year when I first started teaching at Burlingame, we had 59 minutes in class. And then they said, we're going to add a period and we're going to shave four minutes off or something like that from each class. 
So we were expected to do as much in less time. And I think that sums up so much of, you know, what teachers are asked to do. So it's always been, uh, you know, kind of a, a bit of an obsession with, with me. And then how do you you know, how do you design lessons for those within those constraints of time that are effective, uh, that also, you know, take into consideration your own, your own personal and professional needs. So one of the things that I really like about um, the conversation today is it, it just reflects so much of, you know, at the heart of, of the teaching better day by day planner is this idea of, of these six commitments that I ask teachers to make to themselves and their students. Uh, and I like that word commitments, you know, it, it's, uh, you can just hear the concept of commitment behind everything that Jennifer is saying, you know, that, that she does. It's different than standards, you know, it's just sort of saying like, you know, can you, can you make, can you agree that these things are, are important enough to at least be trying to, to do them in your class? Um, and then within, uh, within the planner, every, with each month section, there's a, a thing that I'm especially uh, happy with, which is called the personal professional development pages. So I took up, you know, 12 different books, all from Corbin authors, and wrote up a one page summary of like a, a central idea from a book, uh, like um, Jennifer Abrams book about, um, you know, work, working with with people in classes for better communication. And shrink down just kind of a couple key ideas and there's a page you know facing that that asks you to make connections to your own class about how to apply those to the classroom so you know it's wow this I think is we're a, a fabulous time when teachers resource. don't have a lot of time to read yes 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 we know people don't have time but we need to still be reading and we need to figure out ways to integrate and it sounds like this book is a perfect it's perfect timing for people for teachers now that are struggling to to fit things in and make intelligent choices so the final question relates to uh, a book that i inspired me by uh, richard elmore at harvard who wrote a book on how he changed his perspective on education policy over time teaching and working and i think it brings us to the point for all of us and our listeners that we do change over time and that's what real wisdom is it isn't just learning something and sticking with it for 30 years <laughs> it's learning and then reflecting and listening and shifting as we get more information that makes us more effective teachers. So, uh, Jennifer, I used to think, and now I think, what is your shift over time in your career so far as an educator? Um. I used to think that feedback was criticism. And now I know that feedback is not something to necessarily take personal. Um, and it's something to reflect on to be the best version of you. Um, you know, uh, as a first or second year teacher, I had a lot of kids in my classroom who had a lot of needs. And we had a little guy who had autism. And we had a specialist come in and she just decided that I was doing everything wrong and I was destroyed because I felt like I was working to my full capacity. Um, I was doing everything I possibly could. And, and so she came in and told me that I was doing so many things that he did it like he needed what I wasn't doing. Um, and so now I realize, like if I had the ability to take a step back and like keep my feelings out of it um, and really see how this could benefit that child, um, that it's totally different now, you know, me as a, a 10th year educator, I understand that if I have feedback from a supervisor, that's not about me personally, it's about how I can be better as an educator. Thank you for your honesty and your clarity around this huge shift that changes the whole way you move forward in your career. All right, Jim, what's yours? I used to so think and now I think. <laughs> I used to think it's a it's a great frame uh, to to think about, right? Uh, I used to think that every lesson plan, every every assignment, everything about what I was doing had to be perfect. Uh, especially maybe when I started writing books, you know, then you're sort of there's sort of this this challenge. You're like, make it worthy of being in a book. 
uh, and then and then life happens, you know. So uh, in my fourth year of being a teacher, uh, the school year started, and we knew these things were going to happen. But the school year started with my father-in-law passing away two weeks before school, and then school started, which is enough on its own. And then my son, my second son, being born three weeks later, uh, about a month early. And then my father, which we knew was going to happen also, passing away a week later. And meanwhile, school just goes on, right? You can't like tell your class like, okay, I'll be back in a month and we'll start, we'll start over. Uh, and so I learned uh, the phrase that I would say in my head at moments like that was sometimes, sometimes you have to, it's got, it, you, you need to give yourself permission to be like a B minus C plus teacher so that you can stay in it and get through and continue to enjoy the work and and you know kind of live to be a better teacher another day and you know uh, a couple of years back i guess five years back um i felt perfectly fine but i you know caught a little cancer uh in in april and so suddenly you know i'm out for six weeks and you know all sorts of you know disruption from that and um and so i think that that experience of learning to be the word that i like is agile right like you have to be agile in response you know i mean was anybody able to be even close to a perfect teacher from to that from spring of 2020 to 22 no definitely not and if they tried then they probably just you know destroyed themselves in the effort I want to thank both of you from the bottom of my heart for taking the time and being so generous and honest with your wisdom and sharing with our listeners so everyone can have such an inspiring start to the school year through your lens of experience and knowledge. And Tori, I would like to turn it over to you to kind of summarize what the big takeaways are for our listeners. I'm not sure. I, I have been writing things down left and right over here. Um, lots of big takeaways. I think the biggest thing that is resonating through this conversation is how important relationships are to both of you in, in your teaching and your uh, personal lives, but relationships with students, relationships with colleagues. Um, it, it came up over and over again from your your first stories about your journey into education and how you you know had people who guided you um jen in your case someone who said you know outright you should be a teacher and jim in your case it took a little bit more but it was through relationships that you found your um you, you know found your place in teaching um and then the way the way that you relate to students really touches me i think um jen you talk very honestly about um, connecting with kids. And I really appreciated what you say about feedback um, and asking for feedback and not taking it personally, but thinking about how um, the input from others can actually help you to be more effective and more um, balanced even in your, in your teaching and how you come into the day. Um, Jim, you also mentioned um, your conversations with Carol Jago and how that uh, sort of mentoring that you had from other teachers really kind of led you in a, in a different track. So I really appreciate the, the threaded relationship conversation here. Um, also really loved that you both were really honest about the things that you had to draw on to keep you going in the profession and in teaching during the hard, you know, the hard moments. I think that's a really important takeaway for our listeners that you don't have to be perfect, but you can call on those um, stumbles down the road to kind of build your wisdom and um, carry on when when it's challenging. So I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I appreciate you both so much. And you too, Carol. Thank you for this. Oh, thank you, Tori. And thank you to all our listeners. We look forward to uh, having you join us again in our next episode and have a great start to the school year. Bye for now. Thanks everyone for joining today's teacher to teacher conversation. We hope this time together energized you, inspired you, and reminded you why you chose to become a teacher. You can purchase any of Carol's books and any books mentioned in the podcast online at www.corwin.com. Please leave a review and share this podcast with your colleagues. 
Thank you for listening to the Corwin Teacher to Teacher podcast, a place to share teacher wisdom and engage in authentic conversations with experienced educators. 